a newer, a newer song. It's really an older song that's been given, I think, new life uh, with the, the, new, the modern setting. Um, but it speaks to a lot of the same themes that we'll be looking at as we turn our attention now to the prophecy of Haggai. I'll invite you to turn there in your copy of God's Word towards the end of the Old Testament, very close to the end of the Old Testament, so it may be easier to turn to Matthew first and then go back a few pages than to start at Genesis. As you're turning in your copy of God's Word to the book of Haggai, uh, here in just a moment we will go to the Lord once again in prayer. But Haggai has for us, it may seem obscure, uh, to kind of drop in unannounced in the book of Haggai um, without a larger look at something like Israel's uh, history over the course of uh, their time. But Haggai has a message of hope for those who are struggling, for those who can feel isolated or alone. And that's what we hope to glean this evening in our time together is to find not just the voice of Haggai the prophet, but the voice of Christ our great prophet, priest, and king, who offers for us, yes, sorrows, labors, toils, struggles, but at the end of all that suffering comes a great immeasurable glory that will last forever and ever. I'm not hearing anybody flipping anymore, so let us go to the Lord, to the throne room, and pray together. Would you bow your heads and pray with me now? Father in heaven, Son, seated at the right hand, and Holy Spirit, who even now is filling and illuminating the presence of the people of God, we ask as we come before your word that we would receive it with humble hearts, with awakened minds, that we would not be simply hearers of the word, but doers of it, that we would hear what you have for us, both a call to believe in the great promises that are set forth, and a call to obey the commands that are here. Lord, stir us up to receive all the blessings that you have for those who would read and heed these words in Haggai. Convict us concerning sin. Comfort us in the gospel. Give us a greater sense of assurance because of what we find here for your people. Lord, this is your holy word. Let us treat it in our hearts and minds as we meditate on it together with all fear and reverence. Remove from us the distractions, the sin which so easily entangles our tendency toward conceit, our tendency toward apathy. Lord, all these things are of the flesh, not of the spirit. We ask that you would make us more and more people of the Spirit. I ask, especially tonight, as we meet, as we look to your word together, that you would use this to prepare us for worship tomorrow on your day, the day that we celebrate and commemorate Christ's resurrection from the grave. May we be filled all the more with joy unspeakable, peace that surpasses understanding because of the time that we spent together this evening in your word. It's in Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. As a child, I loved to play with Lego construction sets. Admittedly, as an adult, I still love to, I don't get to do it as much as I used to, but I still love to play with and and get, you know, unbox, put them together, these Lego construction toy sets. Does anybody like Lego? One, two, okay, a couple of us. I love Lego. It's, it's great and it's cool to see what's well, actually kind of frustrating to see the sets that I grew up building and playing. I want to like b- buy it again so I can rebuild it again and it's like worth 800% what it was when it was first available. But a Lego set, we're, we're familiar with these, right? You go into the store, you see on the box, there's a picture printed of what the final product's going to be and you say, oh, I want that. What that final picture presents is, sounds good to me. That's what I want. So I I pick up that box, I pick up that Lego set, and I take it home. I open up the box, I dump out all these pieces, and it's just a mess of plastic, right? But there's an instruction book that helps all these pieces to fit together. 
Now, I would argue to you that the book of Haggai is like one page out of that instruction book. Obviously, we understand the Bible is a storyline. It's not merely you know, rules for living. It does give us those, but it goes so much further. It portrays to us what God is building in redemptive history, starting all the way back in creation and going up until the new creation. Haggai is but one page out of this instruction book. And if you were to tear that page out, remove it from its context, you can have you know, construction part A and construction part B, and you're not going to know how they fit together. Or you can look at just that page, and you're going to wonder, you know, what, what is this exactly? Maybe you can put the thing together, but it's not the finished product. So as we look at Haggai tonight, I hope to demonstrate to you all that it serves an integral part of redemptive history. It relays to us a connection point between the Old Covenant and the New. It harkens back at several points to what God has already done as He reminds His people to remain faithful, continue to believe, continue to labor for the cause of the Messiah, this coming King. But at the same time, it points forward with great and precious promises that there will indeed come a Redeemer, one who will fully and finally give peace on the holy mountain of God. So Haggai sits on the precipice between what is old and soon to be passing away and what is new and what will last forever, between the present evil age and the glorious age to come. Now, of course, we in the New Covenant as believers find ourselves in a similar situation, right? We find ourselves, the new covenant, the age to come has been inaugurated. We're excited. We can't wait to see the fulfillment of all things. And yet we find in this life toil and struggle and a task that needs to be fulfilled that we must undertake with faithfulness, with all fervor and diligence, all while never forgetting to trust in those great promises that we find by faith alone in Christ alone. So before we really jump into the text itself tonight, and we will cover the entire prophecy. Uh, I hope you can listen quickly. We will cover the entire prophecy, but I'd like to give us some light background information so that we can connect this one page to what has come before and what will come after. Haggai is one of the writing prophets. We refer to him as such because we see right here in chapter 1, verse 1, that the word of the Lord comes by the hand of Haggai the prophet. He writes his messages out. He writes them down. He's not a preaching prophet who goes out on the street and proclaims these things, but he writes it out and he sends it as a letter uh, to the people, but specifically to Zerubbabel, uh, who is going to be a king figure, and to uh, Joshua, who is the priest uh, in Jerusalem at the time. And it is through them that the people receive this message. And I think already we have a principle for the new covenant laid forth. God's message is communicated to his people writ large through the prophet, the priest, and the king that he has set forth. Although now it's not three separate figures, it's one in Christ Jesus. Haggai's ministry begins uh, about 20 years after the return from the Babylonian exile. Think about that. The joy that is to come from you've been in Babylon and you've heard all these stories from your fathers of what Israel was like. Oh, you wish you could have seen Solomon's temple and all its glory covered in gold and paneled with wood all around. And finally, Cyrus gives a decree. Go back. Rebuild the walls. Rebuild Jerusalem. So you return with fervor and excitement. And then 20 years happens. Raise your hand if you're over 20 years old. How quickly does 20 years go by? What'd you say? Like that. Just like that. Raise your hand if you're younger than 20 years old. How quickly does 20 years feel to you? That's a very long time. Yeah. 20 years has passed since Israel returned back from the exile. And in that course of time, 20 years is plenty of time to rebuild things, to get back to work. And yet, 20 years has passed and the temple still lays in ruins. The foundation is sort of there, but it's overgrown. It's messy. It's broken down. The altar, they continue to offer sacrifices in the altar, but the courtyard itself is not built up. There's no walls to separate the the main courtyard from the courtyard of uh, sacrifices where the offerings are to be made. 
So 20 years has taken place since the exile. Likely Haggai is an older man. Uh, We infer this from the fact that Haggai is only two chapters long and that by the time his prophecy finishes, the work is yet incomplete. So he probably died before he got to finish his ministry. But he does pass the torch on to Zechariah before he goes. And uh, we can read about what else is going to happen in the lives of God's people in that prophecy, as well as uh, references in Ezra and Nehemiah, which we will come to as well. So Haggai is a prophet, likely an older man, and he is sat and watched as God's people for 20 years have neglected what ought to have been a central part of their lives together. They're God's people. God's people enjoy his presence through the temple, where the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be, where the sacrifices were made. Where else are they going to see pictures of the atonement laid out before them, pointing them most clearly to the Messiah? But in the temple, built up this house, this dwelling place of God with man. And yet, 20 years goes by, and they do not build it up. They let it lie in ruins. And so, this gives us an idea of who Haggai is. Let's look now to the text. As we unpack the prophecy together, we'll have four headings, which are printed there in your handout. First, we see that God's people are, rightfully so, called out. They're called out for their rebellion. They're called out from their rebellion and into service. If you would read with me in your copy of God's Word, Haggai chapter 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? declares the Lord of hosts. Because of my house that lies in ruins. While each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew. And the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills. On the grain, the new wine, the oil. On what what the ground brings forth. On man and beast and on all their labors. God's people are called out. God does not allow his people to waller in their sin for too long. He speaks to them by grace through his messenger, through Haggai. And he calls them to account. You've missed it. God identifies, I believe, in this passage two problems that are present in his people that we can find in verses 1 to 11. The first is a problem of authority. A problem of authority. Haggai gives us the historical setting for his prophecy. I think it tells us something that Genesis begins, you know, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Haggai begins with, in the second year of Darius the king. We read of some pagan Persian king before we read of the Lord's name himself. There is, I think, Haggai sets before us this dueling kingdoms at play in the lives and hearts of the Israelites during that day. Are you a subject of Darius? Or are you a subject of Yahweh? Are you a subject of, the, of Persia and her gods? Or are you a subject of the living God? He sets these things forth. 
Again, the neglect of the temple is the neglect of God himself. Because this is where God dwells with his people. And when they neglect it, they say, I kind of like Darius. He kind of does things right. I mean, if you think about it. When we, you know, sow and we don't reap what we want, it just makes sense that we should sow some more. We should plant more seeds so we can get more plants, right? He represents, Darius represents, uh, and the, the system, the, the people that follow after him represents kind of conventional wisdom, just the way the world is. And yet God calls his people out and says, there is more. There is more for you than what is simply there in conventional wisdom. Who is your king? Is it Darius, the king? Or is it Yahweh? As he's shown forth in his Messiah. We have, again, this contrast right there in verse 1. Darius, the king, who's the king over Persia. And then the word of Yahweh, the true king, comes by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel. Shealtiel is the next in the line of deposed kings, the Davidic line. Zerubbabel is the son of David. And yet he returns to Jerusalem not as a king, but as a governor, as a placeholder, a sign. Jerusalem belongs to Darius. And to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, who is the high priest. God's message mediated to his people through the prophet, the priest, and the king. I won't belabor that point because we've already discussed it tonight. Notice what God says in verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say the time is not yet come. Whose voice will you hear? Whose kingdom are you in and whose voice will you hear? The Lord of hosts is addressing his people and he's saying, I've heard what you all, you all have had to say. Yeah. These people. God's talking about the Israelites. He's talking about those who have returned to the land in Jerusalem. And he's saying, these people. That phrase, these people, is used elsewhere in the Old Testament. Before the exile to describe those rebellious Israelites who got themselves into exile by the rebellion. They rejected God as their king. They gave themselves up to all the false, false gods that surrounded them, and they were led away. And God's saying, that's exactly what you look like. That's what you're acting like. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. God gives his answer in verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? So the problem of authority is revealed in who is your king? Whose voice will you hear? God questions their conventional wisdom. He says, is it a time? For you to neglect my house, this thing that brings all of you together, while you each go your own separate ways and build up your own tiny kingdoms. That phrase again, paneled houses, you panel your own houses, is an echo from 2 Kings. As Solomon is building up the temple, this dwelling place with, between God and man. And then we, we, we read that Solomon panels the inside of that temple with cedars from Lebanon. And God's saying, you've had time to fill my house with glory, to labor on what really matters, what is eternal, and yet you've paneled your own houses before you've paneled my house. You've spent time building your own kingdom rather than being the people of God, dwelling under my own rule and reign. So the people have a problem of authority, but they also have a problem of effectiveness. Seen in verses 7 to 11, a problem of effectiveness. And again, this dichotomy is, is set for us, this, uh, the difference between God's rule and man's rule, the fear of God and the fear of man. A problem of effectiveness, which we see even in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 1. They have sown much and harvested little. They eat but never have enough. They drink but never have their fill. They clothe themselves but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. It's a dire circumstance. But notice what God does. He doesn't say, 
you guys are in a bad way and I'm doing everything I can to bring you out of it. He says, no, I, I put you there. <laughs> he claims credit for their dire circumstance. Look at verse nine with me. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. When you brought it home, I blew it away. I don't want you to have blessing apart from the means by which I've ordained you to have blessing. There is no blessing that you will find apart from communion with me, a relationship with me, the living God. They have a problem with effectiveness. Their conventional wisdom had failed them. Their conventional wisdom had failed them. And then secondly, divine power had stopped them. God intervened. He does not allow, and again, this is a sign of his grace. He does not allow his people to continue in rebellion and sin and wickedness against himself as if everything is fine. So I'll ask you, do you feel that prick when you walk into rebellion? When you willingly enter into sin, does it burn your heart? You long for repentance? This is a sign of God's grace and his favor. He longs for you to return to him and to be found in him. Who do you look more like? Do you look more like citizens of the kingdom of this world? Or do you look like a citizen of the kingdom of heaven? And what you think, and what you say, and what you do, do you pursue righteousness? Do you find yourself frustrated by what you're able to accomplish? Everything that you try to build up always comes to ruin. Do you have an effectiveness problem? What's the solution? How do we solve this? God in his grace has given us the solution. First, he graciously points out our problems to us. He doesn't just say, fix yourselves and then come to me. He says, here's what's wrong. And he offers the solution. What's the solution? It's to be equipped by God, to be brought back into a right relationship, repentance and faith, to return to the Lord, to find what you need. Verses 12 to 15. Uh, there are portions here, um, verses 10 to 11, where God uh, speaks of withholding the dew, sending a drought. Uh, we'll pick up on these themes later on in the book. Verse 12, look there with me now. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Just in verse 12, in that one verse, we have a pretty significant shift. God's people get a new name. It's no longer these people. These people say, you know, something God doesn't want them to say. It's now all the remnant. That remnant language points us all the way back to Isaiah before the exile. Isaiah promises that God will spare a remnant and because of them, the holy line of the Messiah will be preserved. Redemption is still going to happen. That remnant language points us back in the Old Testament when God says, uh, think of Hosea and Gomer. Hosea and Gomer have children and their children are named No Mercy because I will show no mercy to who was once my people. Name them not my people because they are no longer my people because they have rejected me. And at the end of Hosea, he is charged to change the names of his children to mercy and my people. Those who were called not my people, I will call my people. That's what God is doing here in verse 12. He's saying, you who were acting like citizens of the kingdom of this world, you are my people. Now what marks them? Why do they get this new name? What characterizes them? Three marks of the people of God. The first one is the new name. God initiates it. He gives you a new name. He calls you out from your sin and into his kingdom. Secondly, they're given new ears. Look again at verse 12, that the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. Your translation might say heard the voice. I don't know if it does or not, what translation you're using. I'm looking at the English Standard Version. But in the Hebrew, that word is Shema, which you might recognize from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. That verb, Shema, hear, isn't just, you know, the sound goes into your ear holes. 
It means you listen and you long to obey. The new ears means you listen and you long to obey. It is hearing with the intent to believe, the intent to obey, to follow through. Remember again, the command that God gives them in uh, verses 1 to 11, he says, consider your ways, verse 7. Consider your ways. How do you obey that command? You get up out of bed, walk out to your car, and you're going to go consider. Maybe you consider in your car, or maybe you consider at a desk, or maybe you can, you can consider kind of wherever you're at. It happens inside you, in your mind, in your heart, in your affections. They obey the voice of the Lord their God. I have an excursus here that uh, I'll skip. Ask me about it if you want to know more. But this Haggai's words convey God's voice. The people don't respond because Haggai is so great. They respond to the voice of the Lord their God. They hear him and what Haggai communicates. So God's people have a new name. They're called the remnant. They're called those who have been spared. You can read more about the connection between the Old and the New Covenant in Romans chapter 9. How we are grafted in as Gentiles into this body of believers. Second, they're given new ears. They hear the voice of the shepherd, even through the messenger. And then thirdly, they're given new hearts to fear the Lord. The people feared the Lord. They hear God call them out. They hear him threaten their unrighteousness and they tremble. I think I'm taking a young man from my own congregation through the Second London Confession. And one of the signs that we talk about in the confession of new birth is that you tremble at the threatenings of the word of God. You take comfort in the promises of the word of God. That's exactly what the people are doing here. They hear God call them out for their sin and they shake. They don't mock the voice of the Lord. They tremble. They fear him. They're given new hearts. This reminds us of Ezekiel 36. God promises to remove the heart of stone and put in the heart of flesh so that his people would obey. All three of these marks are necessary. You must receive a new name from God. You must have new ears to hear his voice. And you must have a new heart that fears him more than you fear any other human or any other person or voice, even yourself, you must fear God. It is the beginning of all wisdom, as we read of in the Proverbs. Verses 13 to 15 gives us attributes, I call them, of the presence of God. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. Kind of redundant, don't you think? Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, responds with God's message. The point is, Haggai is God's messenger and he bears God's message. I'm going to say it the same way Haggai says it. If it was an English class, you would fail at that point. But God wants to make very clear, I'm the one answering my people. I see their repentance and faith. And I'm going to say something to them. What does he say? I am with you. The temple is still in shambles at this point. No, like, hands have gotten up to go lay bricks. And yet, God draws near to his people because they have believed him. Then the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. Two attributes of the presence of God that we see here in these verses. First, his promise. He speaks his word to his people, and it gives them comfort. This is how he draws near to his people. He speaks to them. The way a parent speaks to their child, the way a child speaks to their sibling. He comes close. And he talks to him. He says, I want you to hear me on this. I'm not going to go through a proxy, although obviously he speaks through the prophets, but he's making very clear, it is me who is speaking. I'm giving you a promise, a word 
I will be with you. Secondly, he comes near to his people through his power. Remember that effectiveness problem? They spent 20 years toiling away and their crops just aren't producing like they want them to. They feel like they never have enough. Their houses can't be nice enough. Their city isn't going to be beautiful enough, clean enough before they can start working on the temple. And yet, 20 days after the first prophecy of Haggai, construction begins. God has done more in 20 days than the people had accomplished in the last 20 years prior to God's coming near to his people through the promise and power that he possesses. These two attributes of the presence of God solve both the problem of authority and the problem of effectiveness. We asked ourselves, whose voice do you hear in your problem of authority? Who will you listen to? God comes near to you with his promise. You have a problem of effectiveness. What I set out to do, I can't do. I can't actually accomplish these things I want to be. You know, we're told by the world, you can be whatever you want to be. You can do whatever you want to do. But you can't, can you? I want to be a bird and fly with wings. Like uh, Jenny from Forrest Gump, right? I wish I were a bird so I could fly away. I'm going to do that. I can be whatever I believe in. That's not going to happen. I'm constrained by what I am. But that effectiveness problem goes away when my will is conformed to the will of the Most High. He empowers his people to accomplish whatever he wishes, whatever he pleases, his purpose. And as my will is more and more conformed to his, I find that my effectiveness problem dissolves. I'm able to do and be exactly what God has made me to do and be, which is a worshiper, a servant of his. There is no greater fulfillment, I'll I'll tell you now, there is no greater fulfillment that you will find than in obeying the voice of the Lord your God and following after him and submitting yourself willfully and lovingly to all that he has for you. His will will be accomplished one way or the other, but you will enjoy it all the more as you give yourself unto him. Ultimately, Israel is to deliver the Christ the Messiah, the promised one of Israel who will bring about the restoration of all things. But they don't really know that yet. They don't quite get it. How do I know that? Because of how easily they get distracted and discouraged in their task. Haggai chapter 1 ends on a high note, right? God's people are obeying. We're excited to see what's going to happen. It's just like when we came back from exile. We're excited to see what's going to happen. We're going to go for it. And then, one month later, Haggai chapter 2 opens. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord comes again by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you that saw this house in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not as nothing? In your eyes? God's not asking this question because he wants to plant a seed of doubt in his people. He's asking this question because he's identifying a complaint that the people have been raising amongst themselves. You see, some of the older folks who had survived through that 50-year exile from the time that Jerusalem was left to the time that they returned to that city, And they've been telling their children about how glorious the temple was and how great it's going to be when the temple is finally rebuilt. And they look after a month of working on it and they say, ooh, it's not as, you know, it's it's not as tall as Solomon's temple was going to be. It's not as wide. uh, I don't know how to put this nicely, but, you know, last time we did this, we had 120,000 sheep that we offered to sanctify the temple and 22,000 oxen how many oxen do you have in your field not that many right I didn't think so Um, I mean last time we built a temple we were able to panel it with cedars from Lebanon does anybody have any contacts in Lebanon where we can you don't they're sowing these seeds of dissent and I'll I'll save the storytelling you can read more about this in Ezra I believe chapter 3 Verses 10 and following. They finish laying the foundation of the temple. And the people have cause for celebration. 
It's the beginning of the seventh month, which is the time that they would be celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. They all step outside their homes. They dwell in tents. They commemorate the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness where they relied on God and Him alone for their sustenance. They remind themselves that He always delivers His people. He always provides what is needed. And it's in this context that they celebrate a feast at this newly laid foundation for the temple. And they bring out their tambourines and they start singing and crying out praises to the Lord. But some of the older men among the priests start to cry out a wail of lament and mourning. It's a bit more graphic and visceral when I give you the the actual facts. And it says that the people were filled with confusion. The complaint of this small group totally stops the construction on the temple. And that's why God speaks to his people again through Haggai the prophet. They've allowed these seeds of complaint, of discontentment, to creep in, to stop them from what God has called them to do. So the seventh month, many, many years ago, was also the same time when Solomon consecrated the temple with all those sheep and all those oxen. You can read about that in 2 Kings. Solomon offers a prayer, and he talks about how heaven and earth cannot contain you, and yet because of your covenant, because of your promise, dwell here. Hear our prayers, because we are your people. All of this is swarming in the minds of these older men, and they're filled with remorse and lament. What they're building is not going to be as big and glorious as what once was. It's going to be disappointing. And they spread that like wildfire among the people of God, even among those younger folks who hadn't yet seen or heard uh, what a temple could be. They're disappointed in their own performance. I'm going to just draw out three products of these wrong complaints. There are biblical complaints that we have in the Psalms. I strongly encourage you to read through the Psalms regularly, devotionally. Uh, Sing the Psalms, if you don't already, in your church. The Psalms have lots of biblical complaints. We can complain about the right things. These people were not complaining about the right things. What are the products of these complaints? First, confusion among the peoples. The nations surrounding, the ones who are already discouraging the people of God, are hearing their own voices echo back out of Jerusalem. We told you so. We told you it was never going to come to anything. Now you believe us. Come back to the kingdoms of this world. <clears throat> They're confused. They don't get a clear message, a clear testimony from the people of God that he is alone worthy to be praised, that he is alone the almighty creator. They're, they hear a confused message. Second, distraction from the task at hand. Those younger folks who had been faithfully working, laboring, they stop. That complaint spread out throughout the whole people and nobody was working anymore the way they needed to be working. They were distracted from the task at hand, rebuilding the temple, by, I've got to do damage control now. I've got to go you know, talk my dad, my granddad, kind of off the ledge and say, it's going to be okay. I've got to stop what God's called me to do to go help somebody else out with their, their thing. And then finally, discouragement from their mission, discouragement from what they were set out to do. They themselves are pierced, cut to the quick. These were the men who were supposed to have been calling them to account all throughout their lives, pointing them regularly to the covenant that God had made, to the promises that he had. And these very men who were supposed to be pillars in that community, pointing their people faithfully back to God, are the very source of the opposition to God's work. So I'll ask some of you older folks, do you help or harm the cause of God's kingdom in your family, in your community, in your church? Are you a voice of encouragement and contentment, rejoicing in what God has given you and entrusted you with? Or are you a voice of critique and discouragement, always pointing out how things could be better or smoother or more effective? Secondly, God doesn't just voice the complaints for the people. He also gives them, reminds them of his commands. He gives them three commands that I identified in this text. uh, And he gives them seven promises to go with those commands. 
he's saying he's going to do a lot more than he calls us to do. And I think that's true all throughout the scriptures. He does call us to a high and holy calling. But we are never going to outdo or outserve God, outgive him in what he offers to us. He pairs these three commands with seven promises in the passage. But let's look at the commands first. Let's look at the commands first. God tells uh, Haggai to speak to Zerubbabel, to speak to Joshua, and to speak to all the remnant, and say, Who was left among you and saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now, be strong, O Zerubbabel. Be strong, O Joshua. Be strong, all you people of the land. This first command is to be strong, to stand firm. Don't give up any ground to the deceiver, to the voice of opposition to what I am doing. He tells Zerubbabel specifically to be strong. He tells Joshua specifically to be strong. And he tells the people specifically to be strong. He addresses all of these various groups that would have been personally offended by the complaints. Zerubbabel, the governor, the one whose job it is to organize the people into their shifts, to put this stone here, to put this wall there, to lay this foundation here. You take the morning shift. You all take the evening shift. Yes, you've been overworked. Take the weekend off. He's discouraged in his task. He must be strong. He must endure. Joshua, the priest, most likely an older man to be about by the time you're the high priest, your father has died and you've taken his spot as the high priest. He's looking at this temple foundation and he's thinking, I'm not going to have 22,000 oxen, 120,000 sheep to offer here. How will God be pleased by what I have to offer? We are small and weak. God is infinite and almighty. I would never be worthy by what I offered here. And God says, be strong. I desire your worship. Not your stuff. I desire you. You are the worshiper that I have created. And I long for you to worship with what you have. Like the widow who offered a mite. And yet Jesus singles her out. You know, Pharisees are over here gold coin number one. And gold coin number two. And gold coin number three. And she sneaks in the back and she drops in all that she has. And Jesus says, she's given more than anyone else here. Because she gave out of her poverty. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. Not an abundant giver, per se. That's what God says to Joshua as, as a high priest. He says, I want you to give me what you have to give. What I've given you to give back to me. You are to be faithful over what you have, not over what you don't have. And he speaks to all the people. He says, be strong. Work, for I am with you. That's the second command. Work, for I am with you. Again, a command paired with a promise. I've given you strength. I will help you in your effectiveness. Get back to work. This was never about what you can muster up for me. It's about what I'm doing through you and for you. This is why the Bible is not fundamentally an instruction manual for how to piece your life together and make yourself something. It's a demonstration. It's a portrait of what God is doing. He is the master architect. He is the one who is building a beautiful and glorious temple. I'm not going to get ahead of myself. He is at work. He is with the people and he calls them to work alongside him. Finally, the last command that he gives them is to fear not. Fear not. Connected to the phrase right before it, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. The almighty warrior who parted the Red Sea to save them from the hands of Pharaoh, he's with them. You have nothing to fear. You don't need to fear the complaints of the people. You don't need to fear the mocking of your neighbors. You don't need to fear your own weaknesses. Because I am with you. My spirit of power and strength, you know, the one that created order out of the chaos before creation happened, I'm with you. I'm here working among you, giving you strength. And he offers these promises 
of the temple's coming glory. So he's voiced the people's complaint. He has ushered the Lord's commands, reminded them of their task, paired even those commands with promises. And then finally, he gives great promises of the temple's coming glory. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Why do I not need to fear not? Because yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Again, God's sounding really redundant here, isn't he? Declares the Lord of hosts. Declares the Lord of hosts. Declares the Lord of hosts. This is a title of almighty power. I am Yahweh, God of the covenant. I keep my promises. You don't have to doubt anything that I tell you because it stands forever. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but my word will endure. It will not return to me void. He's Yahweh of hosts. He commands angel armies, myriads and myriads and thousands upon thousands of heavenly beings. Think back to the Garden of Eden. Who does God appoint to keep Adam and Eve at bay from entering back into Eden? An angel wielding a fiery sword. Who does Isaiah see when he sees the Lord Almighty in his majesty? He sees him surrounded by angels flying about. Think of the way that John the Revelator describes angels in the throne room of heaven having the feet of a bear, the face of a lion, these fearsome creatures. And God's saying, I've got millions of those things at waiting on my beck and call. Fear not, for I am with you. He gives them, I think, three promises of the temple's coming glory. The first is that he will shake creation, something that he will do. He tells them, keep laying brick upon brick upon brick, and while you're at it, I'm going to shake everything I've ever made which is everything that ever existed. I will bring in all the gold and silver that you need, just like I did for Solomon. You forget, he didn't do all that stuff for himself. I worked through his father David to conquer all the enemies of Israel. And Solomon just picked up where his dad left off. I was the one animating all those blessings that your people enjoyed, my people enjoyed at that time. I will shake creation and I will Fill this house with glory. That's the second promise. I will fill this house with glory. Greater than the former. You think Solomon's temple was great? There is a coming temple who is far greater. I'm showing my hand a little bit here. The coming temple who is far greater. Remember the temple points us forward to the Messiah. Where God dwells with man forever. Jesus Christ remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the God-man. Divinity and humanity joined inseparably into one person. What greater glory is that? Is there than that? Solomon's temple pales in comparison to the beauty of Almighty God dwelling with man, tabernacling with us as one of us. And then finally, the third promise is that he will give peace in this place. God will give peace in this place. Of course, this points us to the Messiah. Who else could it point to? Maybe the restoration of the offerings. They've been doing offerings, and we'll see in uh, chapter 2, verses 10 to 19, that their offerings have become defiled because they were defiled. Their hands were filthy, trying to offer what is pure. But God's not saying, I will purify the lambs and goats that you're going to offer in this house. He's saying, I will actually bring a lasting peace that is never going to go anywhere. I'm going to send a lamb who will die once for all, just on the other side of this hill where you're standing. It'll take some time, but I'm doing something mysterious and beautiful. And you guys who are complaining about how it looks, you're so missing the point. It's never about how it looks. I need you to get on task. You build the temple so that I can dwell with you for now and then you will deliver up the Messiah from among you. And he will do what I've set him out to do. I'm getting ahead of myself. 
God promises that the temple's coming glory will be filled with the shaking creation, will be filled with greater glory than the former, and will be the place where peace is finally given from on high. One point of application that I'd like to make before we move forward, and how are we doing on time? Do we need to wrap up soon? Keep going? All right. I'd like to connect this second point, the Lord's commands, just a little bit more closely to home, to where you are tonight. God commands his people to be strong when we feel weak, when we want to do anything but be strong. We want to give up, veg out, watch Netflix. I don't know if you watch Netflix. Do you allow Netflix in your homes? Probably not. That's good. It's filled with a lot of garbage. But that's what we want to do. When things get tough, we want to give up, sit down. God tells us to work. What do we do when work gets tough? We start looking for another job. We want to go do something else. I want to close my math book and go run around the yard, go dig a hole. And he tells us to fear not. God commands us to do only those things that are good for us. We get frustrated at our own weakness because we long to have a backbone. We want to be strong. And God says, do it. In the way that I have ordained for it. Obedience to my commands, doing what I've told you to do. Be strong. And you'll be made strong. Work. And you'll be made effective. I mean, who wants to spend all of their lives toiling after the wind? Striving after those things that don't last. God's saying, here's an eternal kingdom. You can lay up treasures not on earth where moth and rust destroy, where the enemy deceives and kills and destroys. You can lay up treasures for yourself in heaven. You can help be a part of an eternal and everlasting kingdom. Who doesn't want their work to actually result in something? A great and glorious rest. And then finally, he tells his people to fear not. To fear not. Who wants to be a coward? Nobody, right? When you rightly order your life under the fear of the Lord, when you fear him, there is nothing else. Do not fear them who can kill only the body, but fear him who can destroy both the body and the soul. God is saying, when you are rightly ordered under my rule, when you do what I command, you'll have the things that you want. He only commands for us the things that are good for us. And if you find yourself struggling to want these things, when you want to give up, you want to be weak and shut down, God's telling you he will transform your desires to fit with what's best for you. All right, that's enough on that. Let's look now to chapter 2, verses 10 to 19. Verses 10 to 19, and then uh, we'll close with verses 20 to 23, if that wasn't uh, obvious. Cleansed together. Not only are God's people called out from their sin and into service, they're comforted by God's promises and his nearness, and then they are cleansed. This, uh, this, This portion is... One of the more familiar portions for me before I began studying Haggai, uh, and it's not as pleasant as my heading has made it out to be. You see, the people of Israel had been offering sacrifices on a shabby altar all these 20 years, thinking it's fine, it's good enough. You know, God wants my scraps. He can have them. And, you know, we're poor, we're beaten down, we're trying to work on our you know, wall, so people quit coming in and stealing all of our stuff. He understands. He gets it. The people of Israel were trying to approach the right God in all the wrong ways. And over the course of this 20 years, they've neglected the very most important things that they should have focused on. On the 24th day of the ninth month, so again, just a little bit of time has passed. In the second year of Darius, The word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. So God is no longer speaking to all the people 
through the king figure, Zerubbabel, and through the priest figure, Joshua. Now he speaks directly to the priests of the land. And there's a, a specific reason that he does this, and we'll look there together as to why. But first, let's look at what he says and how he says it and how they respond. So he speaks to the priests, asking them about the law. He wants them to give a judgment. I'm going to give you a situation, and you tell me what is lawful or what is unlawful. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil of any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, it does become unclean. Pause. The priests in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 10 and 11, you're going to write that down and look at it later. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 10 to 11, God tells the priests shortly after he has struck down Nadab and Abihu, remind me to come back to Nadab and Abihu, um, he tells them that their job is to first know the law inside and out, apply it to the regular lives, which is what God's calling them to do here, but then he also tells them that their job is to instruct all the people in it. They must know it for themselves, but that's not enough. They've got to share it with everyone around them in God's community. Un unpause. Verse 14, Then Haggai answered and said, So is it with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. So these priests have just gotten themselves into trouble, right? God asks them a question. Give a judgment about the law. If this does this, and they say yes. And well, if this does this, and they say no. They've just outed themselves. They know the right answers. Do you feel like you know all the right answers? They know the right answers, and yet they have failed in their second task to teach the people of what they ought to know, to teach them about what lawful living looks like. I grew up in a home that had you know, two believers. Mom and dad were both Christians, and we were in church all the time. And I felt great about myself because I knew all the right answers in Sunday school, in family devotions. Anytime mom or dad asked me a question about the Bible, I was the first one to get it. My siblings are not so lucky. Um, I took great pride in myself for knowing all the right answers, for having, you know, right on the tip of my tongue, which king and which order, and, you know, this piece happened there, and, you know, Jesus said, I'm the true vine, memorizing scripture verses. But I never did cross that line of helping my siblings to come alongside in holiness with me. I never did take the responsibility for them as well to make sure that they were listening and paying attention. In fact, I often would you know, quickly become distracted, as any child does, uh, when their sibling goofs off. But so it is here. The priests know the right answers. They've got it. They know how to apply the law to their own lives. And yet they're allowing the people to continue to offer defiled sacrifices and offerings before God. And so God teaches in this passage uh, three lessons, verses 10 and 19, three lessons for his people. The first is that holiness is non-transferable. Holiness is non-transferable. You take holy meat and you touch common oil or grain or what have you, that stuff doesn't become holy because it's come into contact with something that's come into contact with something that was holy. This holy meat is never defined. It's only referenced one other time in the Old Testament. And Jeremiah, and Jeremiah asks, can holy meat make you clean? It's funny to me that it's used in exactly the same way in both places, and neither of them tell us what this holy meat is, but it's most likely a reference to the free will offering, where you bring to the temple, to the priest, a sacrifice of just the abundance of what God has blessed you with. And you want to take what God has given you out of the overflow of his goodness, out of the overflow of you've taken what you need and you've got extra and you want to go worship God with it. You take it to the priest and he offers it on the sacrifice. And this 
sacrifice, this offering is not consumed in its entirety on the altar there. You give a portion to the priest and he eats of it. Uh, give a portion to God. And then there's a portion that's left over. Now you take that portion that's left over, you can either uh, take it back home with you, eat it that evening, or you can eat it at any point during the, the next day. This is most likely what this reference to holy meat is, because every other offering is completely consumed, and whatever's not eaten is burned right outside the camp. So this is the only time that you would have meat that's been made holy, it's been cooked holy, uh, and you would bring it back home. And so they're asking about this, this case. God is asking the priests about this case. That holiness doesn't spread to whatever it touches. It doesn't make the other things in the pantry clean. Holiness doesn't just spread by osmosis. By being you know, in a Christian home, by coming to church every Sunday, you don't just become passively holy. It doesn't just happen to you. There are ways in which it, it comes to you, and it, it does at times seem like it's passive, but it's not through osmosis. It's not with or without your consent or your uh, participation. Holiness is non-transferable. Secondly, sin is unacceptable. The people have been offering defiled offerings to God. And it is detestable to him. They're trying to approach the right God, but again, in all the wrong ways. They've not prioritized what God needs them to prioritize. They're offering uh, clean offerings with unclean hands. One of the illustrations that I read in my studies was motor oil and drinking water. You take a glass of perfectly good drinking water probably not from a tap in Kingsport, but perfectly good drinking water, and you add motor oil to it. How much of that water are you going to drink and is going to be good for you? None of it. it you ruin the whole glass. Likewise, you can take a big you know, 10-gallon bucket of motor oil and you add a glass of water to it. Are you going to drink that? All right, let's say we add five gallons of water to it. You gonna drink it now? No, they just don't go together. The motor oil has totally defiled all of the water. It's, it's all unfit to drink. So it is when you try to make a holy offering with unholy hands. When you try to walk in repentance with no faith. Christianity is not something that you can just put on or pretend. You don't get any points, bonus points with God for that. You must be made holy. You must be cleansed. God makes a reference here to being defiled by touching a dead body. And then he immediately goes to the temple. So he's making this analogy between the temple, which is broken down and destroyed, and the defilement of touching a dead body. When you offer what normally would be holy in an unholy place or in an unholy manner, and again, the temple is used we have to understand Haggai in light of Christ. It points us directly to him. God is saying, you touch this dead body of a temple. And you're saying it's good enough. It's fine. And God's saying, no, it's not. You're defiling yourself. What is dead must be raised again to new life before anyone can be made holy or cleansed by it. The third lesson is that fruit is unattainable for sinners. Here again, we have echoes of what we read about in chapter 1. Uh, let's look at verse 15 and following. Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider. From this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. Pause. 
They've been offering defiled offerings before God, and he has been striking them, keeping them from the covenant blessings that he promised all the way back in Deuteronomy. He said, if you're faithful to me, then you will find blessing. You will have what you need. If you are unfaithful to me, you will have calamity. You will have disaster on your hands. And over and over again in Haggai, God is saying, you have found nothing but disaster. Left your own devices, you have done nothing but rebel against me. But, pick up right there at the second half of verse 19. From this day on, I will bless you. The people have been looking for lasting fruit. I've been laboring for 20 years to try to find some of that blessing that God said he was going to give me. Why can't I find any of it? God's saying, because you totally defiled yourselves. You've forgotten what's most important. You're focusing on yourself as an individual rather than what on the community needs most, and that is the temple to be restored. God says that he sends uh, blight and mildew. Is that what it says? What verse is that? Blight and mildew and hail. Verse 17. Blight is a time of not enough moisture. The plants will sprout up for a moment and then they don't have what they need in the, in the grass. Because so they have a dry season and rainy season. The rainy season needs to rain enough so that the ground is fertile enough for the whole year so that the plants will grow up. And God's saying, over the past 20 years, you've had a lot of blight. Years where the rain didn't come enough. A time of, of destitution. But he says he also sent mildew, which is a time when the ground gets too much rain. The result is the same. There's still no fruit. Whether you've had abundant blessings like in the time of Solomon, what happens in the immediate generation after Solomon? The kingdom is ripped in two. Or a time of blight in Israel's history. They're wandering through the desert, through the wilderness. And what do they do? They despair. They turn away from God. They reject him. They question his messenger and Moses. In times of uh, mildew, during the times of Solomon, they're led to pride, depending on themselves. And so I ask you, what do you do in your seasons of blight or mildew or hail? When God has blessed you with much, do you turn around and praise him greatly? Or when God has withheld his hand from you, do you depend on him more faithfully, more fully? Or do you question him? Do you doubt him? Do you complain? Do you find yourself filled with discontentment and grumbling? Fruit is unattainable for sinners. I've got a, a fourth lesson there, and sorry that the numbering didn't work out to be one, two, three, four, but four, five, six, seven for some reason. The fourth lesson there is Christ. Blank. What I'd like to do is to pick up here at the very end of verse 19 but from this day on I will bless you and then we're going to let that promise go all the way back through what we've read to verse 10 you see Christ accomplishes in his work the opposite of what you can accomplish in yours so you can put an apostrophe S Christ's work accomplishes the opposite of yours that's for the, the blank there from this day on, I will bless you. How on earth can God bless this defiled people for whom fruit is unattainable? There is no lasting benefit for them that they can hand on to their children. They haven't been earning up you know, a greater flock, greater money. They're losing all their stuff. They're worried if they're going to make it to their own retirement, much less have anything to leave for their children. How can they find lasting fruit? Because their sin has been tainting their offerings, making their offerings unacceptable, detestable to God? How can they get the holiness? It's not through osmosis. It doesn't just get transferred to them passively. But Christ's work accomplishes the opposite of ours. Christ, who is holiness himself, is able to touch a dead body, like he does in Matthew 18. He doesn't become unclean. Because you turn around and that body's not dead anymore. He's just raised someone to life. The woman with a discharge of blood who is ceremonial unclean pushes through the crowd, making everybody she's touching unclean. 
She reaches out and touches the hem of Jesus' garment. And what happens? He becomes unclean and gets cast outside of the camp, right? No, the issue of blood stops. She's made clean. She's made holy because she has come into contact with him who is holy himself. Sin is unacceptable. The offerings that we make before God, even as you know, we think as Christians, we come in and we worship, we sing to God. Even as we do that, it is mixed with sin. Even as I stand here and you know, present this message of Haggai to you, it is mixed with my own sinfulness. You're listening sinfully. And yet Christ, because of his offering that he made with clean hands, a holy and unblemished lamb, slain from before the foundation of the world, he washes our offering as it ascends to heaven. And he makes us acceptable before God. He cleanses us. And he grants to us fruitfulness. But we are unable to stir up for ourselves. He gives us a heritage. He gives us a heritage through the power of the Holy Spirit. The gospel that we have is a gospel that has been handed down to us. Whether your parents were believers or not, someone proclaimed the gospel to you faithfully, biblically, and you received it with all joy. Recall that. You were part of that fruit. You're part of this blessing that God promised. Pass it on. There will be more fruit. You can take comfort because of Haggai's message that when you sow those seeds of faithfulness to God's kingdom, when you share the gospel and explain it, when you raise up your children in discipleship, when you raise up your friends, you point them to the gospel over and over and over again, the word will always accomplish it, what it was set out to do. It will always do what it was set out to do. Because God is the one at work. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. Finally, we have verses 20 to 23, the commission of God, which you can scratch out what's printed there. The commission together is not a great title for this. I couldn't think of another one that started with a C. Forgive me. I'm trying to be a good, uh, a good Baptist. It's all right. We, we need to be faithful to the text, not to what rings well. Verses 20 to 23, the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai in the 24th day of the month. Same day, second message, this time speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I am about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders. And the horses and their riders shall go down, every one by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. So these last two prophecies of Haggai kind of shift away from just the people writ large. Obviously, they apply to everybody. But he speaks specifically to the priests, as we've already seen, and now he speaks specifically to Zerubbabel. And in speaking the word of promise to Zerubbabel, he offers blessing for the whole nation. He offers a blessing for the whole nation. Uh, two points that we're going to take in three layers, if you'll allow it. The shaking of the nations and the taking of the king. First, God promises to Zerubbabel specifically, I will shake the nations. Reminiscent of what he's already promised earlier in chapter 2, that he's going to shake the nations to bring in the gold and the silver. But God's not talking about bringing in riches at this point. He's talking about judgment. He's going to dethrone emperors. He's going to undo empires. He's going to destroy the kingdoms of this world and establish his rule fully and finally. And he says to Zerubbabel, I'm going to take you, my servant. I'm going to take you and put you at the top of all of that. Now it's funny that, that God says this to Zerubbabel because, I mean, prior to looking at Haggai tonight, who knows a lot about Zerubbabel. Like when you're studying world history, he comes up a lot, right? He was one of those, like Alexander the Great and Zerubbabel. Yeah. No, Genghis Khan, Zerubbabel, King Tut. No. He's kind of forgettable, right? Forgettable Zerubbabel. He's not made this glorious king over all the nations in his own lifetime, is he? 
That doesn't happen. So what's God really getting at here? What kind of promise is this? What does he mean that he's going to shake the nations and take Zerubbabel, forgettable Zerubbabel, and make him king? Even when you read through the New Testament, he comes up less than Melchizedek does. He's mentioned only one time in the New Testament, and that's in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the beginning of Matthew's Gospel. God is saying, Zerubbabel, when I destroy kings... I'm going to take you, and through your line will the Messiah come, this lasting Redeemer through whom life is to be found. He says, I'm about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. Persia is going to fall. Darius will not be king forever. Uh, God never slumbers or sleeps, but he's essentially saying, I topple empires and kingdoms in my sleep. I do this sort of thing all the time. I did it with Pharaoh in Egypt. I did it with uh, Assyria, with the Syrian uh, Empire. I did, I'm going to do it with Persia. I'm going to do it with the Greeks. I'm going to do it with Rome. I do this all the time. This is why you never put your trust in the nation. You never put your trust in men because the plans of men fail. They're guided by God. He's in control. So listen to him. What he has to say matters. He says he will shake the nations. When he destroys Babylon, Israel will be left alone. Zerubbabel is not going to be deposed or undone then. Now, obviously, for uh, one reason or another, Haggai never says, Zerubbabel, you're going to be crowned king, uh, coronated over Israel. And that never does happen again until, uh, I believe, Jesus Christ, when he's crowned king after his resurrection. Um, but he's given, he, he's, he's told... This is uh, the second boy taking the king in the first, the first layer, kind of two Zerubbabel, that the Davidic line is being restored, the Davidic kingdom is being restored. He calls Zerubbabel my servant, which is a title used oftentimes to refer to David. David, my servant, with a heart after my own. David refers to himself all throughout the Psalms as the servant of, of God, your, your humble servant. He says that Zerubbabel will be his servant. He says that Zerubbabel will be his signet ring. This is something that a king would have with him, either wearing it on his hand or around his neck, and he would use it to seal up documents, whether it's a new law being passed, a pardon being offered. If you saw that seal on that piece of paper, you know, set in wax, you knew the king touched this piece of paper. It's been close to him. It's a sign of him. When you see that signet bearing the mark, it represents the king. God's saying, when the people look to you, Zerubbabel, they will see that I am reordering what has been disordered in Jerusalem. I'm putting it all back. What was once scattered and broken is being made new again. And finally, again, pardon my uh, alliteration here. He says, Zerubbabel will be his selected, his chosen one. Zerubbabel who's a nobody in the grand scheme of things, at a time that's kind of embarrassing in the history of Israel. They spent 20 years rebelling against God, and God says, yep, that's what I'm going to use. If there is no Zerubbabel, if this promise here is never made to him, there's no more Old Testament, there's no New Testament to come. Because God purposed Zerubbabel, forgettable Zerubbabel, to be right where he needed him to be. To be this chosen tool for his purpose to be accomplished. This implement, this instrument of redemption. There's a second layer, though, that we look at the shaking of the nations and the taking of the king. And that's in Christ. The kingdoms of the world are toppled as Jesus hangs on the cross. And he sheds his blood for the sake of the redeemed. All those that he was ransoming at that time. Jews and Gentiles are brought together. The borders that once separated them are crumbling and falling down. As Jesus hangs on the cross, the nations are shaken. The thrones of kingdoms are overthrown. The strength of kingdoms and nations and all of the bickering and strife that we still see today gets undone. In the kingdom of heaven, won by Christ's blood, we have neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, Scythian or barbarian, but all are one in Christ. 
Secondly, for the taking of the king, Jesus is God's ultimate servant. Remember back to 2 Samuel chapter 7 when God makes the covenant with David and he says, as long as your son obeys me, he will remain on the throne. You will never lack an heir on the throne. But when they disobey, then I'll take the kingdom away from them. That's what's been happening all throughout Israel's history. But who is a more faithful son of David? Greater far in faithfulness to God than Jesus Christ. He will never disobey his father because they share the same will, because they share the same essence. His kingdom is forever. It will never be taken away. Jesus is himself the signet ring of the Most High. He is the sign to the whole world. When he is lifted up, he draws all men to himself. We see Jesus and we worship the living God in him. And then finally, he is selected. He is the chosen Messiah, anointed, slain before the foundation of the world so that all of this Old Testament stuff, these sinners, these horrible, horrible people might have life and forgiveness through Christ and what he has done. It is only by faith alone in the Messiah, in Christ alone, that there is any sort of salvation for anybody. It's only through God's grace alone that any of us, though our offerings are defiled, would have hope that God would receive them with great joy, singing his song over us because of what Christ has done and who Christ is. And yet, I feel like a salesman, but wait, there's more. There's another layer in which this promise is to be fulfilled, and that's for all those in Christ You see, when we gather like this, tomorrow morning when we gather in the church, we're part of what God is doing to shake the nations still. We're doing battle against the kingdom of darkness. And God is overthrowing the kingdoms of this world, the prince of the power of the year. Whenever churches faithfully expound the word of God and worship the living God, we're doing war against the kingdoms of darkness. The age to come is destroying the present evil age as it writhes in agony. And then in the taking of the king through Christ, all those who are in him will one day reign with him in glory. We will be his servants and we will serve him with great joy because we've been washed by the blood of the lamb. We've been ransomed from every people, language, tribe, and tongue. We are servants of the most high. We are signs to the world of salvation and of judgment. There is salvation in no one else, which means when you're in Christ, you have nothing to fear. Fear not, for I am with you. But when you're not in Christ, you have every reason to fear. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God, the living God who is just, who answers, who does not allow his people to continue in rebellion. (coughs) Woe to those whom God does allow to continue in rebellion. We are, as the church, a sign of both salvation and of judgment the signet ring, we point as Christ's body to our living head, to him who unites us mysteriously by faith. And then finally, we are the select. We are the chosen of God. Chosen not just for salvation, but chosen to display the gospel to the world. We are his favorite tool for evangelism. We are his favorite tool for uh, continuing the faith to be handed on to generations to come. It's through the church that the gospel is protected. We are the pillar and buttress of the truth. It is our duty and our job and God's blessing to us to promote right doctrine, to correct false doctrine, to stand firm, to be strong in the Lord, to work for the kingdom that does not perish, that lasts forever. And to fear not the terrors and woes of the world around us. Haggai may seem like just one page out of the grand instruction book of what God is building through his kingdom, but it is a critical page. We have in it both conviction for sin and comfort in the gospel, a promise that there is life not just for them then, but for us now. But if we turn to him by faith, we repent from our defiled ways and we ask Christ to sanctify our offerings to the living God. He will answer those prayers. 
As we labor in God's kingdom, he will provide us with the strength that we need to endure, to continue to work. He's brought himself near to us. If you would turn with me, we'll close here. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. And of course, we could go to Matthew chapter 6 and speak of how Christ promises that God will bless us. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these will be added unto you. Matthew chapter 28. We'll begin in verse 16 and read to the end of the chapter. This is our commission in the New Testament. The task at hand where Christ, I think, echoes everything that Haggai said to the people then. May it be a call to you tonight as we close. Hear the words of your Savior, the voice of the living God speaking to you. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The disciples did not receive this commission because they were good enough. They were filled with doubts. And yet God blesses them, Christ blesses them by giving them this task to labor in a kingdom that will never end, to work because of his abiding presence and strength. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. God, our Father, we thank you for this word that you've given to us. We thank you for the truths that are here. We confess before you that as I've sought to explain these things, I've done so in a faulty way. As we've sought to understand these things, we've done so in a faulty way. We ask, Christ, would you cleanse our thoughts and our attitudes? Help us to receive these words and be not just hearers of it, but doers of it. That we would labor in a kingdom that does not end. That we would build the living temple through discipleship and evangelism. That we would seek to spread your knowledge across this globe through the steady faithfulness to your word that you called for. All authority in heaven and on earth is yours. The gold is yours. The silver is yours. The bride is yours. And yet you invite us. You invite us to take part for our good, for our joy, and for your glory in the task of calling out to the citizens of heaven, calling them to repentance and to faith. May your sheep hear your voice. And may we turn to you as our only Savior, our only hope in life and death. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.